Um, Welcome to the second lecture of the Philosophy for the Public Workshop. I hope you enjoyed last time's lecture. We had a lot of audience last time and as well today. Today is the big question, does God exist, part one. We have Professor Katarina Bello, Associate Professor from the Philosophy Department, giving us the talk today. She specializes in Islamic philosophy and medieval philosophy. And she's giving us the talk, does God exist, all through the question all through from the Greeks, uh, passing by the medievals, Christian and Muslim virgin, Averroes. She specializes, by the way, in Averroes, Ibn Rushd. Uh, and she's then going to the modern times. We will have a one hour lecture followed by an hour to an hour and a half discussion and debate. Just welcome Professor Bella with us. This one? Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I'd like to um, thank um, Yosra Hamuda for this uh, initiative and uh, for inviting me, and also uh, the Philosophy Club, who's also involved in the uh, organization of these lectures. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the question um, uh, for today, um, uh, does God exist? Um, if we think... Um, from the perspective of, um, of the philosophers, we find that uh, a majority of philosophers, at least um, up until and including Hegel, will say that God does exist. Um, but since um, this is philosophy, uh, it has to be uh, this, um, the existence of God um, has to be uh, proved. So it's not accepted on basis of uh, authority. Um, and so, basically, I'm going to talk about the proofs of God's existence. But just to mention um, uh, some, some exceptions. So I said most philosophers say that uh, God exists. But um, uh, there are some exceptions um, in, from, from uh, the very beginning, from uh, pre-Socratic philosophy in ancient Greece, um, a philosopher or a sophist like Protagoras said, we don't really know uh, about the gods. Um, and Epicurus as well uh, later stated that if they exist, uh, we, we do not know um, if they exist, they don't really, uh, we don't know if they really care about us, about uh, human beings. Uh, however, so, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about so much about the exceptions, maybe we can uh, discuss that uh, um, after the uh, um, once I've gone through the, the proofs. Um, so I'm going to focus on, on the proofs and actually also the uh, c conception of God. Um, so um, uh, in, when I said uh, um, this is, uh, um, that in philosophy it's important to give a reason and provide a, a, a proof, that's not to say that there isn't uh, uh, an influence uh, uh, from religion, um, there is, and there are connections, especially in the medieval period. Um, but in, in uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the proofs of God or, or the uh, proofs of God's existence uh, in ancient philosophy, and then I'll focus on uh, medieval philosophy because that's also my uh, uh, specialization. Um, and as I said, so it's important to uh, to, uh, to prove God's existence based on and reason and not authority and not uh, scripture. Uh, and so if you go back to ancient Greece um, already, and well, we know that um, um, ancient Greek religion accepted um, several gods. Uh, however, we find that the, uh, um, the philosophers um, emphasize uh, the existence of one, one principle of, of the universe. Um, already in, uh, in, in Socrates, there's a very clear belief in God's existence. Um, and uh, so Socrates there, uh, believes that there's a, <coughs> a goodness, the principle of goodness, um, ruling uh, all events in, in, in nature and in the universe. And for instance, one of the Platonic dialogues, um, the Phaedo, um, 
uh, Socrates mentions the legacy of uh, uh, one of his predecessors, Anaxagoras. And uh, so Socrates was initially um, very impressed with um, Anaxagoras because Anaxagoras mentions a, an intellect which uh, rules everything. And uh, Socrates thought, well, he's talking about uh, uh, God and the, uh, <clears throat> the existence of one, one principle. And it means that everything is, um, happens um, uh, for the best reasons. And in um, here we find that um, uh, Socrates, for Socrates, this uh, belief in uh, in God is related to to also belief in in providence. So the idea that things don't happen uh, by chance, um, but but they happen for a reason and and ultimately um, uh, for the good that uh, things uh, happen for a good reason. And uh, it, he also um, uh, uh, believes in the existence of this uh, a single uh, intelligence. So there is an intelligence uh, ruling the universe, and this is the nous in Greek, or the intellect. And uh, this also shows that, yes, things happen for a purpose, and in this passage in particular, he mentions this, uh, the, the final cause, so the purpose <coughs> for which things happen. And uh, <clears throat> um, and he opposes that he, he distinguishes that from the um, the efficient cause, which is the cause of the scientists, the immediate cause, which precedes an effect. And um, uh, and so we see this in in obviously it's difficult to distinguish um, when we're reading the Platonic dialogues what exactly um, Socrates defends and what um, is typically a Platonic. But it's, it's clear that um, and, uh, Socrates um, believes in God or believes in the gods or believes in spirits. We know also from the, uh, well, he was um, uh, accused and um, um, <clears throat> and charged with, uh, with um, impiety and, and, and then convicted also. He was not um, the first philosopher. Uh, so when we're talking about, uh, obviously this is a more, a more general question of the connection between and the relation between philosophy and religion. So several uh, philosophers were accused of impiety, of not being religious, and uh, so already Anaxagoras, and he had to leave Athens. Um, Protagoras as well, the sophist, and he left Athens, and while well, he was not Athenian, and neither was Anaxagoras. Uh, Socrates as well is charged with uh, impiety. Um, and he decides to stay because he's an Athenian, <clears throat> and he believes, although it's uh, an unfair, the verdict is unfair, he decides to stay and, and be executed. And, um, and also Aristotle was also accused of impiety, and he also leaves Athens. Um, <clears throat> so we see here, but uh, although there was this uh, um, complicated uh, <clears throat> uh, relationship, between um, philosophy and religion already in ancient Greek, so we can't say that it's it's uh, um, uh, it only starts in the Middle Ages. No, uh, so this uh, um, it's it, it goes back to the uh, birth of philosophy. This connection, but we see the way <coughs> uh, Socrates, Socrates talks about his own beliefs. It's clear that um, he thinks that um, um, things happen for a purpose, and that there's this intelligence. Um, ruling uh, in, in the world. And uh, in another dialogue, Plato also talks of a, a demiurge, so a, a craftsman, which imposes order on, on uh, chaos. And uh, according to the Timaeus, <coughs> this dialogue, <coughs> the world is the result of um, a rational decision. And again, it's oriented towards um, the good. Um, and uh, he mentions in his dialogues other gods Plato and Socrates in the Platonic dialogues, um, but the idea of one one single principle of the universe starts uh, imposing itself. <clears throat> um, another uh, philosopher. So clearly, we have this idea of one principle and of the world in uh, uh, Socrates and in and in Plato, and uh, one of uh, well. Plato's most famous pupil, Aristotle, um, he systematizes um, 
Plato's philosophy, well, actually moves away in some respects as well. Um, and um, he, um, he also mentions very clearly uh, um, one single principle of um, uh, the world, and, uh, and he does uh, provide a proof, so, um, <clears throat> um, and he speaks of um, a prime mover, so, of, so he thinks that uh, life and activity is tied to, to motion, and, um, and things are moved by other things, but there has to be, uh, ultimately, there has to be uh, a first mover of everything, and this is uh, God. And he actually proves uh, God's existence, or the existence of a prime mover in, uh, in physics, in his physics. Uh, he also refers to, to God um, as, uh, and now we come to the conception of God as, uh, as an intellectual, as an intellect, God primarily as an intellect, and this is a view that will prevail also in, in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, so um, <clears throat> in, uh, in, in his metaphysics, he also mentions God, and he understands God as uh, thought thinking itself. So it's uh, um, an intellectual activity in, in God. Um, God's main activity is to think, and the object of his thought is God himself. So it's a self-reflective activity. And on the part of human beings, um, uh, the main goal is to contemplate the truth, and this is a, um, a divine activity. Uh, and obviously, the, this paves the way for uh, medieval conceptions of, of uh, God and uh, proofs of, of God's existence. Um, and then um, between, so I'll mention also um, Hellenistic philosophy, and we have uh, different schools, so the legacy of Aristotle and that of Plato was uh, developed. The, uh, so the, uh, the peripatetic school that was um, based on Aristotle's philosophy, and uh, we have the academicians, the academy that was Plato's school. Um, but there were other two important schools um, in late antiquity, and, uh, and those were the, um, the Stoics and the Epicureans, and they also, uh, some of the main aspects of um, uh, these two schools are actually also uh, also relate to God and the, the question of uh, the question of God, um, and so there's something which is not mentioned explicitly in Plato and Aristotle. It's implied, but not mentioned explicitly, um, which is the question of providence. And providence can be understood um, in different ways, um, as um, uh, on the one hand. Um, ruling uh, uh, the universe and events, uh, but also as uh, providence is also about um, whether God cares for us and, uh, and thinks of individual things in, in the universe. Um, so whether the gods are concerned with uh, human affairs. And this was discussed by the Stoics and the Epicureans. And uh, the Stoics were um, determinists. They say everything happens for a, um, a specific reason. Uh, so they, they say that everything is determined by a uh, universal reason, um, the Stoics. And Epicurus, who had his own school, uh, defended that the gods do not concern themselves with, if they exist, they do not concern themselves with, uh, with human affairs. Epicurus was also famous for developing um, this uh, um, theory of, uh, Atoms, which was first developed by Democritus, but he uh, adds something: the um, the idea that um, at, uh, the atoms can uh, swerve, and and this can give rise to haphazard events. So clearly, we have uh, um, determinist out outlook on the part of the Stoics, and uh, a different position in, in the Epicureans defending um, um, chance events. And so, uh, obviously, then Plato and Aristotle uh, set, set the tone for the discussion uh, to come. Um, <clears throat> and um, well, then I, well, I'll say what some, some, some of the uh, 
main principles of all these um, proofs of God's existence. So there are many ways of um, of proving um, God's existence. And um, uh, later in uh, now I'll move on to uh, also late antiquity, but uh, Christian philosophy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, he, he has a, a, a proof of uh, God's existence in uh, his uh, dialogue on free choice of the will, which was one of the uh, main uh, topics debated by, by Augustine. And um, um, he, he provides a proof in this dialogue, and uh, he makes a distinction <clears throat> between uh, and and now, now it's an explicit, well, there was already, obviously, Aristotle already uh, proved that uh, uh, th there has to be a first principle of movement in the physics, and, and this is obviously based on a certain idea of uh, causality, that things don't happen just like that. They have to have a cause and a reason. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in patristic philosophy, um, Augustine, who was one, well, Patricia, because he's one of the fathers of the church. Um, he makes a distinction between um, things which simply exist, uh, such as a stone, um, and then uh, there are certain things which, in addition to existing, they also live, they also have life, like an animal or a plant, say a flower. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have uh, beings which exist, have life, and have understanding, such as human beings. So I'll just write. Um, And so um, what, what he says is, obviously certain things simply exist, like a stone um, or this sheet of paper. Uh, but there are certain things which exist and they have life, like animals. Um, and there are other beings, like human beings, that they understand uh, and they have life and, and they exist. But the implication is um, that uh, it's not possible to have life without existing, obviously. And also, it's not possible to understand, have understanding without being alive and without existing. And, and since we can think of um, a wisdom which is greater, or, or something which is greater than human wisdom, and we have the idea of a perfect being, obviously that perfect being understands. And if that being understands, uh, uh, and has greater wisdom than us, then he has wisdom. He, he, this means if he has understanding, he also has life uh, and existence. And this is, uh, is a proof uh, provided by Augustine of um, uh, God's existence. And, uh, and obviously so many philosophers in, in the medieval uh, period um, uh, tried to provide uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, proof of God's existence. Um, and so I'm going through some of the proofs. Um, and, um, and obviously then we can debate uh, regarding the, the, uh, how convincing they are. Um, in, um, and then so I'll move now to, uh, so between um, uh, when we're talking about uh, medieval philosophy, uh, a very important period, uh, as I mentioned, is um, uh, patristic philosophy, so the fathers of the church. and um, and also uh, uh, Neoplaton they were influenced by Neoplatonism, which is a, a, a school developed by Plotinus, who was incidentally from Egypt. Um, and um, in, in terms of Christian philosophy, um, uh, scholasticism is also, which is developed much later, is also a very important uh, uh, school. But we have also um, in the Islamic world uh, um, a, a tradition of uh, philosophy, and uh, naturally um, 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 these uh, uh, Muslim philosophers also tried to provide 
uh, proofs of God's existence. And to say, well, uh, just a little bit about um, uh, Islamic philosophy, there's obviously a uh, very important influence from uh, uh, Islamic theology, uh, Elm al Kalam, and, um, but also a very strong uh, influence from uh, uh, Aristotle and, and Neoplatonism. So Aristotle is really uh, the most important philosopher for a medieval uh, Muslim philosophers. Um, and usually they, um, um, and so they, they think about uh, um, causality in nature and how to prove, uh, how to prove God's existence based on uh, causality. Um, and the question of the, the, the chain of, of causes. So there are two ways of proving uh, God's existence. On the way, on one hand, um, uh, we think about uh, God's nature. So this would be a little bit like the one provided by Augustine, that we think about God's nature. And obviously, this is a perfect being. And obviously, a perfect being cannot lack understanding. And if he doesn't lack understanding, then he also has uh, life um, and existence. And or we could uh, so uh, uh, prove the ex existence of God based on the nature of God. But also, we can think about the, uh, um, the uh, we could start from creation and prove God on the basis of creation. Well, that's a little bit what uh, Aristotle uh, does in the sense that we think about movement here, and there has to be an ultimate cause of, of, of movement. And so, um, so we can prove God's um, existence on the basis of God's nature, or starting from uh, creation or created beings. And, uh, and in that case, we think about causality, and we go from creation to, to as an effect to God as cause of creation. Uh, and so we start from the top, from God, or we could start from the bottom and work our way up to um, God. And uh, one, one um, um, famous philosophy, philosopher, um, Al-Farabi, uh, and he died in uh, 950, he explains the nature of God as um, Incorporeal, and obviously now he's also setting the, the tone for his uh, um, successors. Uh, God is one. Uh, God is thought. This idea that God is intellect. Uh, he also says that God is uh, joy and and life, and that he is uh, infinite. And and he, he explains also creation as a, a process of emanation from uh, from God. So he starts with God, and then um, he describes the uh, effects. Of, of, of God or the one um, as, as creation or emanation. But I'd like to focus on, um, on uh, Avicenna, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd, and there's a debate going on between them as usual. Well, um, it's known that Ibn Rushd often um, criticized uh, Ibn Sina for various reasons, and um, Ibn Sina uh, um, was coming from the uh, um, from the, the East, uh, and uh, Ibn Rush is from um, Al-Andalus. So um, Avicenna follows in the footsteps of um, Al-Farabi. So Al-Farabi is consider, uh, considered the, uh, the second teacher after Aristotle, who they consider to be the first teacher. And, uh, and he has a kind of proof of God's existence um, uh, uh, just fr from the nature of, of God. Um, and uh, so w one of the questions is, uh, since Aristotle had uh, um, defined the, uh, the different sciences, um, and, um, and uh, Aristotle says that each science has its own subject matter or genus, it, uh, um, uh, uh, the question comes up, and also because um, Aristotle defines, well, f uh, physics is obviously the uh, study of nature, um, uh, in Aristotle and metaphysics, well, there are two aspects to uh, metaphysics. One is um, metaphysics st studies being as being, so that's ontology, and uh, metaphysics studies the uh, supreme being or, or, or God, and that's theology, and it's a kind of uh, uh, natural theology. And so there's a debate, obviously. Um, there were many um, Aristotle's works were well he wrote on all the different subjects and um, and uh, later 
Ibn Rush says he was, the, well, basically the greatest genius um, um, from antiquity onwards. Um, and uh, and uh, Ibn Rush credits him with founding the disciplines of logic, um, physics, and, and metaphysics. But now it's not very clear um, uh, which, which science should uh, prove the existence of God. Um, and, and since there's, there's the um, uh, um, a proof of the prime mover in the physics, sh should physics uh, prove um, um, the existence of God? Uh, so, um, so the question is, which science proves the existence of God? So God is, according to Ibn Sina, God is a purely a spiritual reality, and obviously they will read um, a scripture in a metaphorical way if there's any uh, description of, um, of um, um, any anthropomorphic description of God. Obviously the philosophers read this in a metaphorical way. Um, and uh, so for Ibn Sina, he says, since God is purely spiritual, we have to prove God's existence in metaphysics and not physics, because physics does not deal with spiritual um, reality. And, and, and so metaphysics is the study of that which comes after physics. And uh, a metaphysics studies being in itself, so for, our, for our soul and supreme being God. Um, uh, but... Um, if, so if God is the subject matter, of, uh, if we say that God is the subject matter of metaphysics, uh, metaphysics cannot prove, uh, uh, provide a proof of God's existence. According to Aristotle, this is a very important principles, no science can prove its own uh, first principles, because otherwise it's, there's a, a vicious circle. And so if, uh, if for instance, um, um, a science, um, let's say, uh, science deals with a certain genus that genus or the thing which a certain science studies the, the proof of, that, of of its existence must be provided by by a different science and so uh, we can't have a science that both proves god's existence and deals with 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 god where, where god is the subject matter so we have to uh, there's a, a complication here um and uh, how does he solve the problem so he thinks that um, metaphysics is the highest science dealing with spiritual realities. And so um, metaphysics does not uh, prove the existence of God, cannot prove the existence of God. Um, and also uh, the subject matter of a science uh, or its existence it is proved by a higher science. And um, so what does he do? He says, um, he doesn't think that physics can provide a proof of God's existence uh, because uh, natural science is not worthy of providing this proof. Um, and, uh, and so he says that, um, in fact, so the, his solution is to say that the subject matter is metaphysics uh, or being, qua being, or the existence in, existent in itself rather than God. Um, and, and this is one aspect, obviously, of, of metaphysics. So he, choose, he chooses this one, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, chooses this aspect of metaphysics, the idea that it studies being qua being, and, but, but then it is possible to provide some proof of, um, <coughs> of um, God's existence in, uh, in metaphysics. Um, and then uh, he uses the idea of causality, so that some things produce others, um, in order to uh, prove the existence of God. So um, he says, uh, so he says there are basically two kinds of beings. Um, uh, things that are, well, uh, we can think of three kinds actually. Uh, possible beings, beings that are possible in themselves but necessary through others. And, um, and also one being which is necessary in itself. Actually, um, Al-Farabi had already uh, established that uh, there can only be uh, one principle, and he showed all the contradictions that, um, that happen if we try to think of two uh, main principles of the universe. So basically, Al-Farabi already proved that there has to be only one God, and not more than, than one God. And uh, obviously, uh, Ibn Sina um, starts from that position as well. 
Um, and so he says, so possible beings don't actually exist, but whatever exists, he says, exists through a cause. And so in itself it's possible, but um, it's, um, it exists or it is necessary because Ibn Sina says existence and necessity are the same. They exist through another cause. But ultimately, we, we have to reach a being which is uh, necessary by itself. And this, and this is God. And there's also this idea that there are no infinite uh, chains of, co uh, of causes in Aristotle. Um, and uh, so I'll, maybe I'll just... Uh, We have to reach um, a cause which is not a, so a real cause, ultimate cause, which is not an effect as well. So because we f if we don't reach an ultimate cause, then uh, there's an infinite chain and there's no real uh, cause. And in this, is, so this is the idea uh, behind uh, many of the proofs that we find um, in the Middle Ages. And also for, for Ibn Sina, existence is a primary subject, which does not uh, need to be proved. So we we, we know that being, existence are, are real. We don't need to prove that. And um, um, God's existence, according to Ibn Sina, is neither self-evident nor unprovable. So it can be proved and it's not evident, so we should prove God's existence. Um, and God is cause of creation and he also keeps the universe um, um, going. Um, and so it's not possible to have an infinite uh, regress of, of causes. And so he proves um, that God is the first co uh, cause of existence of the universe. There's s some differences uh, with respect to, um, to Aristotle. He has different ideas about uh, possibility and necessity. And also he, he, he makes a distinction, in the, which is why also he's not going to use the proof in the physics. Um, uh, the proof uh, of uh, uh, the existence of a prime mover because he doesn't, he makes a distinction between God and, and the prime mover. So God is one thing and the prime mover is something else. In, 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 in Friedman Sina, as uh, for other philosophers, God is purely uh, spiritual and transcendent. And then uh, Ibn Rushd is, uh, he tries to, to revive Aristotle's philosophy in its uh, uh, purity because he thinks this will. Um, make uh, philosophy, falsafa, uh, less liable to uh, attacks from um, Islamic uh, theologians um, because there was also, well, we find in ancient Greece the accusations against the philosophers. We also find in medieval um, Islam accusations so of, of impiety, takfir, against, um, against uh, uh, the philosophers. So in, in particular, Al-Ghazali, um, Abu Hamid, who's, um, who uh, condemned Al-Farabi and, uh, and, and Ibn Sina as, uh, as uh, heretics on, on different, uh, because of certain um, positions which they defended, and that's another chapter, so, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll focus on the proofs. Um, and, um, uh, and so Ibn Rush, so he, he thinks that, actually, so he's following Aristotle, but it, this is for a reason, he thinks that, um, uh, uh, that way he can uh, circumvent these uh, accusations by the theologians. And, uh, and so he does accept, like uh, Aristotle, that he identifies God with the prime mover, this unmoved uh, mover. He thinks the, the, the causes of movement cannot be infinite, so if there's movement and life, etc., um, there has to be a first cause, and we go back to that, the chain of causes. Um, also, there's the idea that uh, a finite body cannot contain uh, infinite power, and so there has to be an infinite power ruling the universe. And, um, and so according to Ibn Rushd, any generated being or created being uh, terminates, leads up to a necessary or an eternal being. And so um, the subject matter of metaphysics for Ibn Rushd is uh, so separate existence, so this is different from Ibn Sina because he does think that um, 
God is the subject matter of metaphysics. Um, he, he also does not accept uh, Ibsen's views on possible and necessary, because for Ibsen the possible simply doesn't exist, and, um, and for him God is necessary in himself, and uh, for Ibn Sina, all beings are possible in themselves, necessary through another, if they exist, because the cause of existence is, um, um, is a necessary cause. And, um, and um, whereas for Ibn Rushdie says, uh, possible beings actually exist, they're contingent. And, um, and so he says that the, uh, we have uh, possible beings, and then we have celestial beings are different from um, uh, earthly beings, and he says that, uh, so uh, the celestial spheres, they are uh, possible in themselves, necessary through others, and God is necessary in himself. And, and so he has a completely different um, philosophical system from even Sinas, although they're both, um, um, both admired um, um, Aristotle. So we have some differences here with regard to the proofs, which discipline uh, proves um, uh, God's existence. And, um, uh, and also uh, what kind of proof and how do we think of existence and um, uh, different modalities, necessary existence, possible existence. Um, and then I'll just mention briefly because uh, then um, this other proof has many important ramifications. In early scholasticism, so one of the first, or perhaps the first scholastic philosophies, now we move again to the Christian, uh, Christian philosophy, um, in early scholasticism, uh, we have um, uh, Anselm, Saint Anselm, um, who lived in the 11th and early um, 12th century in Europe, and um, and he has he develops this proof which uh, became very famous and um, and um, is then taken up by other by Descartes and then it's criticized by Kant later. But I have to leave something for my colleague, Dr. Robert McIntyre, next uh, in in. Uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, and so according to St. Anselm, the proof um, of God's existence lies on a, it's a mental um, experiment. So what he says is, when you think about God, uh, God is that greater than which cannot be thought, or basically uh, the, the highest being we can think of. And so it's the highest, it's the highest reality that can be thought. And um, and he also says that God is perfect. This is very important. Um, and, and because of that, existence must belong to God. So God cannot be perfect without existence. So if you think of, about this pen, that it exists, and in God, if you think of God as not existing and this pen is existing, this pen is more important and better than God, which doesn't make any sense. So um, and this is how, so it's simple proof, but in, there's some, uh, Criticism later, already in Anselm's time, actually, um, and um, and he also says Anselm says how do we should we think about God? He says whatever we think is good, we should um, predicate it of God as as something infinite. So we say happiness uh, is a good, so God is perfectly happy. Uh, justice is good, so God is perfectly uh, just, etc. And uh, so there's a criticism of this proof in Anselm's time and later in, in Kant, as we know, because he says that the existent is not really a predicate. It's not th something that you add to something like, uh, like, um, like other predicates. So then that's a, another long chapter. Um, and finally, I'd like to, uh, so still staying in the Middle Ages, um, um, there's one uh, philosopher and theologian who um, summarizes all these uh, different proofs and uh, this is uh, Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, in the uh, Summa uh, Theologica, so his main work, which he actually didn't finish because um, he died, but he'd already written uh, most of it. And um, in um, part one, uh, article th three, there's the question. Um, uh, the question is whether God exists, which is the question of this, uh, 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 of this le lecture. And, um, and so this is, um, uh, part one of the Soma, question two, in, in the third article. And uh, it uses a certain uh, uh, model of, um, um, uh, uh, in, in scholastic, um, uh, the, uh, so question and answer, 
uh, uses this model. And so he assumes that which he, the opposite of what he's going to prove. And so he says, it, it, it seems that God does not exist. He's assuming this. Uh, and so this is the objection, and which he's going to be uh, to uh, uh, prove uh, false. And he says, the existence of God can be proved in five ways. And so the famous five ways of Aquinas. So the first one he says is uh, motion, and this is the one mo uh, most closely based on Aristotle. And he says, so the first proof from motion, and he says, in the universe, uh, some things are in motion, and, um, but nothing uh, can move of itself unless it's moved by something which is already actually moving. Um, and so things have to be, whatever's in motion has to be moved by another. Uh, and this is also based on an Aristotelian principle that nothing goes from potentiality also from being, let's say, idle to becoming active unless uh, something prompts them to become active. And so finally, it's this proof that we must arrive at a, a first mover, uh, and, and that mover is uh, God. Um, we can think about, so motion in terms um, as... Um, an important element. Then the second proof is similar to this one, but he talks about uh, efficient causation, which is a little bit like uh, like motion. Um, and again, the idea is that uh, nothing is uh, an efficient cause of itself or causes itself, uh, because this would mean if something causes itself and the efficient cause comes before the effect, if we caused ourselves, we would exist before we exist, which is obviously a contradiction. Um, and so uh, we have to have the f first the cause and then the effect when, you talk, when we talk about efficient cause. Uh, and there's no, again, no infinite series of causes. Um, and he says we need an ultimate efficient cause, which is, that's God, uh, because otherwise they know nothing else is. We don't have the intermediate, the causes in between. We don't have an ultimate effect. So we need uh, to have this, um, um, ultimate cause and this is based on this is based on uh, causation so the first uh, way was regarding motion and this one is about uh, efficient uh, causation um, and then also um, a proof the third or the third proof of the third way is uh, clearly model on uh, Ibn Sina uh, and so the, the uh, beings that we see around us they are possible well actually contingent really um, they must depend on something which is necessary, which, which makes them uh, uh, exist. Um, and so we have uh, beings here which are possible in themselves, but necessary so that they actually exist through something else. And again, ultimately, we have to um, um, arrive at a being which is necessary and, and contains no possibility. Otherwise, again, it's effect and and cause at the same time. And so again, this idea that we cannot, we have to arrive at a first principle. And this first principle is, um, is God. And so there's no infinite series of possible beings. And then the, the, uh, um, the fourth way is um, based on um, the, the qualities found in things or gradation. So when we talk about qualities, we, we um, uh, we think of more or less, let's say, uh, we talk about heat, uh, there's uh, something can be hotter than something else, and he says that the maximum heat, let's say, in each uh, genus is, is the cause. So they would say that fire is the hottest thing and it's the cause of everything that is, that is uh, hot. And um, we could apply this to the qualities, the, the true and the best and the noble. And again, he says, there's something which is the cause of all being, uh, of all goodness and all perfection, and, and, and this is God. So also based on causality, this is all based on, um, all these are based on causality. So the idea that you can't have something without, it has to be produced by something else. Um, and, 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 and that we have to arrive at an ultimate, at a first principle, in a first call, otherwise the whole system uh, crumbles and makes no sense. Um, and then finally, the, um, the fifth way or the fifth proof is based on the idea of providence, which we've seen was developed already in um, Hellenistic philosophy. <clears throat> and um, 
and this is uh, based on the governance of the world. And, uh, and the proof is, so how do we prove that um, there is providence, things don't happen by chance, that they actually make sense and there's an intelligence, so we go back to Anaxagoras, uh, an intelligence which uh, rules uh, the universe, and um, uh, he says that things that, uh, even things that lack knowledge, they act for an end, like um, you know, the spider in the, uh, in the web. Um, so these things act by uh, design, uh, even, um, so let's say animals, which uh, or we think about bees in the way uh, um, um, they produce honey and all that, they act by design. But this can only happen through, we see that there's a, a logic to this and it's only through some intelligence. And, and, and so, because these animals don't have intelligence, there has to be um, something behind um, the orderly way in which these animals act. And so this means that uh, uh, God exists and he is the uh, being by whom all natural things are directed to their end. Um, and, uh, and so this is the, fi the fifth proof. And, um, and, and, and there are other proofs as well. Uh, so um, Aquinas lived in the, uh, in the um, 13th century uh, in Europe. And so we see that, um, uh, well, they're, they're, so one of the main ideas um, that we find um, in all these proofs is that there, there's no infinite series of causes. This is very important for Aristotle. And also, they also deny that, there's, that this series of causes could be uh, circular. It cannot be circular. There has to be a first principle which is independent of the, uh, the system. And obviously, this means that there's a transcendent uh, God. There's also the idea that there's nothing in the effect which is not in the cause. So the cause <coughs> or the effect is something which is um, already in the cause. And, and, thing, and also the idea that things don't happen. Uh, nothing comes out of, of nothing. This is uh, actually this goes back to the pre-Socratics uh, Parmenides. So um, the, um, uh, these proofs, um, by way of conclusion. Um, are based on the ideas of uh, causality, uh, the order we find um, in the world, and, and the need for, uh, for first principle. And obviously, so we find, for instance, that um, the ancient philosophers accept, or some of them, they talk about several gods, but uh, really the proofs, uh, these proofs concentrate on the existence of, of one principle, and we saw also someone like Al-Farabi, and, and even, uh, even seen as well, um, uh, they prove that, uh, and that, that's, very, that's complicated, so I'm not going to go into the details, but they prove that can only be one principle, in that if we think of two or more principles of the universe, then there will be uh, contradictions. So ultimately we have to arrive at one first principle. And obviously that's uh, in defense of uh, mono monotheism. Um, and, um, uh, and so I think these are the main ideas, and uh, so I'll leave, uh, I have to leave something for my my colleague, Dr. Robert McIntyre, is going to deliver the second part of, um, of this uh, uh, lecture or, uh, on this topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. We're starting now the discussion and debate. So basically, you start with the questions to Professor Bello, and after the questions, we'll have a, a phase of a debate. Uh, first question. Yeah, I wonder if uh, there are any modern uh, efforts of my philosophers to try and... <laughs> uh, to, to prove God's existence? Yeah. Uh, by the way, maybe a question that's right, that's right. Um, um, yeah, uh, Descartes uses uh, one, one of the proofs, he uh, develops one of the proofs, uh, he actually has two in the same book, proofs of God's existence and uh, uh, Barclay as well. So in the modern period, they're... Uh, uh, in, um, I, I think also, yes, yes. And even using logic, it's, I think it's possible uh, to provide some kind of, some kind of proof, yes. I th yes, definitely. Ye yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Professor Whoopi. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, in the and, yeah, I'm sure you can yeah, yeah. talk about this need for a first principle. Right. <laughs> no, actually, I'm going to talk about something else. Um, 
in, in mathematics, we, we prove things based on some action or some assumptions. So uh, yes. uh, all the proofs actually have to be clear about what are we assuming. So uh, the problem with the proofs of God is that actually the proof of the, the existence of God is that some of them do not make it very clear what are they assuming. All right. And uh, of course, you can actually attack any proof like that. Yes. Say, well, okay, now you said this, and actually, I don't, I, I, I don't agree on it. So um, my first question is when I, I think they actually make, uh, at some point, they make the, 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 the turn uh, into uh, putting all the actions or the assumptions that you are basing your uh, existence of God proof on. And, um, and I think this might have happened in the 20th century, but maybe can, can you just add uh, to the question is, again, I'm sorry about like, rephrasing it, but uh, yes. when did philosophers uh, uh, verify about what action are they assuming? Yes. When they actually go to believe uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to that God exists? Yes, I think this Spinoza, I think he, but again, I need my colleague who's, <laughs> who's a specialist in modern philosophy. Yes. Okay, my second question is that, okay, how about actually doing the opposite? Instead of actually assuming things and then proving the existence of God, how about actually doing the opposite? Instead of assuming things and then proving the existence of God, you assume the existence of God, and then you prove things. It's almost like, the, like, like what we do in physics, and what yes. in physics that actually make some positive which are assumptions. Yeah. And then you do some theory, you basically prove many things, some of these things match the, 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 the real life. Yes. And the fact if you somehow explain the real life uh, by proving things about the real life from these assumptions, you start believing in these assumptions. That's actually what physics is about. They actually believe in some yeah. postulates or assumptions because they somehow explain the, the universe, yes. or the, what we see in the universe. So. Um, did anybody actually uh, uh, elaborate on what would the assumption of the existence of God lead to, and how does that match with the universe? Yeah. Yes, I think uh, because there are different kinds of proofs, and I didn't give them names. Well, I mentioned the uh, ontological, which starts from the nature of God, and maybe those might be your axioms. I'm not, so this idea of uh, a perfect, that we can think of a perfect being, and what goes into that perfect being, and existence would be one of those uh, perfections. And this would be starting from the assumption of God. And then um, we can also start uh, assume in this, start from creation and, and, and so work our way backwards or upwards. And, um, and so we can start from God and work our way down or start from creation and work our way up. But um, I think it, they also, um, I mean, they, they don't want to start assuming, I think, and then I know you teach logic as well, um, there, there could be a problem if we start assuming that which we want to prove. So uh, that would be sort of uh, a secular um, argument. So I, th I think that they avoid that. I haven't come across, at least in ancient and medieval philosophy, I haven't come across the assumption that God, um, that God uh, exists. But unless we think of the, na we start from the nature of God and then we're already assuming, in a, in a sense, since God is perfect, that he exists, and perhaps that's also circular. But um, I don't think they want to start assuming immediately. Uh, I haven't seen that, because I think they're afraid of doing something, a circular yeah. argument. Can you actually clarify the second question? I'm not saying that you, just, you start by assuming that God exists, and then you prove that God exists. Yes. You start to assume that God exists, and then you prove things that you know is true. Mm -hmm. right? And in fact, somehow you feel that, well, the, the, axiom, the axiom of the existence of God is vital in proving all these things that you yes. cannot prove without Otherwise. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And, and when, when this happens, you start to feel that, well, maybe we should believe in this axiom. Yes. Yeah, I think maybe this idea of, um, yeah, the idea of providence. So the idea that uh, ev everything ha seems to have a purpose in life, and if you look at um, uh, even the way the human body is structured and the organs uh, and how everything how they work together, and clearly, the, the, uh, obviously, we have a mind and an intellect, but that the body itself, how this would be a proof of, of providence and a proof that, that uh, so there would be no providence without God's existence. So perhaps, say, I'm not sure if that's, that? but there may be something in, in contemporary philosophy which is closer to um, yeah, the kind, yeah, the kind of proofs that you, uh, you're mentioning. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I yes. think what that goes would be biology, with that, right? Yeah. yeah. What goes with that is more something well, within illogical. biology and within science yeah. more than philosophy. It's called intelligent design theory. It basically says that um, everything has a specific sort of an intelligent design and there should be some sort of an intelligence behind it. And it has roots within somehow philosophy. I think the idea of the, in, the intellect yes. goes yes. to that. Uh, yes. but it doesn't have direct relationship with philosophy. It's basically scientists who uh, create relationships between the idea of perfection and how th um, how life is really. They think that life is really perfect somehow and it has some sort of an intelligence. So there should be an intellect behind it. But this does not have roots within philosophy. It's more within science. Okay, we have a question here. Yes, it's not very... <laughs> no, it's, you know, it assumed that, you know, for um, every cause there is an effect and the cause and effect and then... Or, or at least e every effect must have a cause. Yeah, and yeah. then we, we could reach an, uh, uh, an ultimate effect, which also is not a cause, but... Yeah, but my question is, why can this be infinite? I mean, this can go forever. No, b because if it's, if it's infinite, and they say it's so it cannot be circular, they also prove it cannot be circular. Yeah. Um, so if it's infinite, every cause in the series is also an effect. And if every cause in the series is also an effect, it's not fully a cause. So you never have a, a, real, a real complete cause. So you have to reach a first principle in that. A first principle which itself is infinite. That's, it, that's, that's right. But, it, but it, infinite but above the series, but actually transcending the, the yeah. series. That's right. In that, that principle is not uh, is not an effect of anything. It's it's just a cause, and it's com completely active. It's not potential, and it's not passive. And yeah. it's infinite, but the chain itself is not infinite. exactly. So the chain cannot be infinite, cannot be infinite. but but the first principle is infinite. Yeah, I have another question. It's regarding the text on the left of the board. Yes. Yes, but this this was this was one of the uh, this was one of the uh, the criticisms. But even Superman is not is not a perfect being. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, he's very powerful, but not not yeah yeah. Can I can mm -hmm. I answer sure. what after you answer? Sure. Yeah. Uh, concerning this critique, it was actually <coughs> also um, given to other than Augustine. We will talk next time, Professor McIntyre's talk. It's about Santa Anselm's proof, the ontological yes, I think proof. He, he would, yeah. uh, this idea that there should be perfection, therefore there should be existence with perfection together. And the critique is is basically the idea not of Superman, the idea of the, uh, the, the theory that there might be a perfect life. So for example, if you think about a perfect island, for example, and you just say that perfection goes with existence, then the perfect island exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is one of the famous critiques, yeah. but it is not that superficial. Professor McIntyre will explain next time that it's, it, this critique is very valid, but it, it is not as superficial as it looks from the outside. Yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting, um, <clears throat> a very interesting question, and um, they do make a distinction. Um, so we, when we talk about the different sciences, and uh, they'll say different sciences deal with different things, and, and for instance, 
Uh, Ibn Sina says, we, we cannot prove the existence of God in physics, through physics, for instance. Um, and Ibn Rush says, well, we, we can because he finds a way. Um, I think in principle, I mean, there are different ways of dealing with this. Some philosophers would simply say, if we look, looking for a physical, sort of physical evidence of God's existence, some philosophers might say, well, we could talk about miracles or some theologians, but uh, also working from a philosophical perspective, we can mention miracles. But some of them might say, uh, someone like Ibn Sina will say, we, we don't really, because God is purely spiritual, um, we don't prove the existence of God in physics. We prove the existence of God uh, in metaphysics. And someone like uh, Ibn Rushd, who also has his uh, proofs, he'll say, uh, when we're talking about nature, we, should, we shouldn't say, well, uh, God caused this. We, we should talk about, we should mention the immediate cause, the immediate cause of a certain natural effect, and not go to the ultimate cause, which is God. So he says, actually, when we're talking about physics, uh, uh, um, in discussing physics, we talk about natural causes and, and, and not God directly. So it depends on which discipline. But when it comes to the proofs, um, some say, well, we, we, you, you, some would say we shouldn't use nature to prove uh, God's existence, but you, you'll use metaphysics. So different philosophers have different views, which discipline studies uh, or provides the proof of God's existence. So, but, but that doesn't mean they, they will find a proof, not, if not in physics, then in metaphysics. Yeah. I would call it a theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sharif? Um, okay. okay. That's Wittgenstein, yes. Yes. So he said, all these different saints, like Essex, like Scottish distance, has no meaning. Yeah. I have, to, I have something to say about this, actually. Um, yeah, but uh, Wittgenstein was, uh, um, and this is from uh, the Tractatus, so it's an, early, it's an early work. He was still, uh, um, I think, very close to the Vienna Circle. And uh, one of the things uh, they defend is, uh, and obviously, um, well, um, in, in, in they defend this uh, theory, which is verificationism, that you can only talk about things uh, in a meaningful way, which you can verify empirically. Um, but then that means, well, you can talk about the rain, you can you can talk about uh, physical phenomena, um, but poetry doesn't. Make, it's not just, for instance, uh, theology that doesn't make any sense for the uh, uh, philosophers of the Vienna Circle. Also. Um, well, metaphysics, theology, none of this, but, but by definition, they, they're denying the existence of, of um, I wouldn't say mental, but uh, sort of spiritual uh, realities. But that's because they define from the start that you cannot talk about these things, but I mean, then, well, also you will get rid of poetry and, and, and maybe politics, because that's also not really empirically verifiable. So I think that's a very, that's a kind of a reductionist approach, which uh, it's a certain approach, but I, I don't think, uh, um, I don't think, I think it's, uh, it's, very, it, it's, it, it's a very reductive approach. So, uh, and, and we've seen that the debates regarding, even in the medieval period, which science should prove the existence of God and, uh, but, but there's been a, a revival in, uh, of metaphysics and ontology, even in analytic philosophy. So, uh, and so the Vienna Circle, it's a very specific approach, and this is the early Wittgenstein also. So, um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense if you're, yeah, you deny, you, you start with the denying, without, without proving, you deny the existence of certain realities, or, or you say that they don't make sense, but then poetry also doesn't make any sense, which I think is a, a problematic assumption. Yes. It's not a rigorously defined. Uh, <coughs> I think the definition varies from one philosopher to another. Is there some 
some agreed upon definition we can use to prove the existence of God, we need a, a less shaky uh, foundation. But I, I do think that the different uh, understandings of causality, uh, causality um, contradict each other. I think they complement each other. So we can think of cause in terms of movement, we can think of cause in terms of existence, but the idea is always that um, there's nothing in the effect which is not in the cause. So you're not going to find something spontaneous, let's say. Everything that is the effect must come from the cause somehow. And uh, so this is one of the main ideas regarding causality. And we know that, that there's a cause because there's some sort of resemblance between the effect and the cause, or the, uh, the effect would not exist without the cause, or without the action of the cause. And so these are general principles regarding causality. This has been obviously um, some philosophers like Hume and uh, Al Ghazali, who's a theologian, also deny the principle of uh, causality for different reasons. Um, but I think it's I, I think it's also difficult to deny the idea of causality. So we can use one or different understandings of causality, but I think they complement each other. There's no contradiction. Uh, how, how do you prove that uh, nothing can uh, come, no effect can come spontaneously? Because I think that is needed in the proof uh, for God's existence. Yeah, good question. Um, yes, I don't know. Did yeah. Well, uh, Mark, I understand. Quantum theory precisely. Uh, yes. 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 Well, maybe there will be a new theory, which we'll, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess this is the, uh, but I think even in modern physics, so with Newton, uh, there's the idea that, you know, you, uh, within a system, you have the same uh, amount of energy and you, there's no, uh, uh, I think this principle is still valid. Maybe not in quantum, that's the deal. <laughs> Exactly. So I was talking about modern Newton, yeah, Newtonian, yeah. So maybe we'll have to wait. Sorry. How do we prove something like that that nothing can come Well, I guess it's 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 a principle. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not. So we use it as an axiom of sort that nothing can come and take for granted that nothing can come from nothing. That's right. It it goes back to Parmenides. It's very old, so. Yeah. Can I? Mm -hmm. Actually, not all philosophers agree that nothing can come out of nothing, or that there is there is absolutely a cause. I think Hume disagrees. Nietzsche, as, as well, is mm -hmm. very skeptical about the existence of a cause. In this sense, he says basically that language makes us imagine that there are causes. So he says something like, "He moves, she moves." This is language, but you never find the verb moves. So you always assume that there is a cause behind things. So not all philosophers really agree on the idea of the existence of a cause. But most philosophers, if not all, who believe in, uh, in a god, believe in causality somehow. Is Hume a theist? That's so, uh, well, we don't really know, right? Exactly. Hume well, might be a believer, but he's still very skeptical about causality. But, so it, but, it, yeah, but it's interesting that someone like Ghazali, uh, Al-Ghazali, who was... Um, uh, philosopher, uh, theologian, um, he, def he denies causality in order to say that everything that happens is the direct effect of God's action, and so to preserve, it's uh, sort of the opposite of uh, humor, uh, and to preserve the existence of miracles, so uh, this is why he says there's no secondary causality, there's only, the only cause is always and only God, and that's, that's causality. Okay, question? Sorry? Yes. Yeah, well, then you use scripture, you use authority. So you still accept God's existence, but not based on human reason, but based on the Quran. In, in, is, but, but then they say this is this is what you have to believe, uh, not human reason, but but scripture. Okay. Hi. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, so the question of, of the proofs, why do we have proofs, and in, in also with um, um, uh, medieval, some medieval philosophers who were first theologians and then uh, in philosophers, so they're different approaches. So they say, uh, although it's natural to believe in God, it's, it's also true that some people don't. And so this is why they say, uh, in, 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 so it's not evident, several medieval philosophers will say, it's not evidence to everyone. Uh, that God exists, and this is why we have to uh, to provide uh, uh, proofs. But obviously, they say, and they say, certain things about God is impossible to know through reason. Uh, uh, about God's nature, they'll say it's only in Scripture. Depending on the philosopher, someone like Anselm, for instance, will say we can prove the Trinity just by reason or or the incarnation. And someone like Aquinas will say it's not we only know of these things really s through Scripture, and we we can't reach. Um, certain aspects of God's nature through uh, reason, but again, so reason is 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 uh, is a means to an end. It, it's not really, especially for for the medieval uh, philosophers. So the idea that yes, it's natural to believe in God, but some people don't. So we need to provide a proof. Yeah. Um, also, concerning this Freud, who is a psychologist, also a we consider him a philosopher. Some consider him a philosopher. He basically says that what we call nature is basically the proof that God doesn't exist. He basically says if it's natural to believe in God, then God is just a need for security that we have psychologically. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God doesn't exist. So the idea of just God coming natural because all beings or all human beings search for God by Freud is just a proof that God is just uh, an illusion for security. So it's it's really controversial. It's not that superficial. So my question is actually to the gentleman's question here, and probably at least he's coming to well, is that it's a problem of definition B, right? Um, and in definition the race objective, where mm -hmm. maybe the whole need for God is more someone else's psychological need, and then he's stuck in a lecture trying to figure out what God is. Yes. And for her, it's a psychological need purely, for example. Um, and for me, it's, it's also linked to the definition of time. Like time is something that's very hard for anyone to, to define, uh, unless he suggests a watch is a good uh, uh, evidence for that. So the question is really, what what is the different definitions of God if it's not psychological need uh, from mm -hmm. And the second question is, I would find it very interesting to understand what you believe in if we may ask, like, mm -hmm. because it's, it's unless it's something very controversial to talk about in front of an audience. Not really. It's personal. It's personal. Then it's, uh, yeah, I know it's personal, of course, but then it's philosophy, right? So yeah, yeah. Why not? <clears throat> yeah, because obviously maybe I gave a certain, well, the way I presented the lecture. Um, <clears throat> I think if we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a psychological need. And this was also, uh, actually, we can go back to ancient Greece and uh, <clears throat> now I forget the name of the philosopher, <clears throat> who says that uh, um, different peoples uh, picture God in different ways and actually resembling them. Uh, so, um, um, but I think when we talk about a psychological, we already in say it's a psychological need. 
we already start from a purely human level and we're not talking. So if we say, well, it's just a psych it's, it's just someone like Feuerbach, this is why I said, and to, up to, to Hegel, uh, I, I, they were atheists and agnostics and atheists, you, even in, in medieval Islam, and they got away with it. Um, someone like uh, Ibn Rawandi um, was a complete atheist. Um, <clears throat> um, but I think if we talk about the psychological, um, psychological, um, um, this purely human psychological perspective, then we don't, um, yeah, we start from the human level and we, we never go beyond it. So, <coughs> so I think it's, it's, it's problematic to say that. But someone like Feuerbach, and this is after Hegel already, he says it's, uh, God is a, a purely human projection, and then we find that also in, in uh, Marxism and, and, and other philosophers. So I think it's better to start from, um, uh, even though our minds are, are, f are finite and limited, that it's possible to think of the existence of an infinite, uh, uh, an infinite being, and it makes more sense. And even almost from a logical level, I think it makes more sense to to think of this infinite, even if we we can't really conceptualize it because it goes beyond our. Uh, so yeah, so I, I would, uh, but e e we find differences even in medieval philosophy. Um, how far reason can go in proving God's existence or, or God's nature. And, and also, there's a limitation that um, we, with all these proofs, there's still atheism. So is, is, this, the, is this the way to, to prove God's existence? And, and, and what's, what's, how does faith relate to this? So, and obviously, there's something uh, uh, emotional or, uh, or related to the will and not just the intellect when we talk about um, faith. But obviously, I would go with these, someone like uh, Thomas Aquinas and saying, yes, we can provide proofs, but um, there's only, reason can only go uh, so far. But, but I, yeah, so I wouldn't go with these, um, with the psychological or with Feuerbach or with Nietzsche, because I think then we, uh, we uh, yes, human reason is limited, but we're lim limiting ourselves even further if we say there's no other reality than, than this human reality, which is limited and finite. The double truth, yes. That's right. Yes. Necessity. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, regarding the first part, I think you were talking about the decisive treatise, the Fasl al Maqal, where he says one of the points that cannot be doubted uh, is uh, uh, yeah the afterlife, the the existence of the prophets, and uh, the existence of God. Um, and yes, I think he says we can use reason or we can approach truth uh, through reason or through the the Quran, and he does he does say that. Um, 
and also, uh, yeah, the second question, well, it's again this idea that nothing comes out of nothing, so uh, that the cause makes the effect necessary, or that um, uh, if it's a real cause and uh, it's effective, then it will produce the effect in a certain way and it will produce it in a, in a determinate way. So I, there's a, a link between <coughs> causality and, or some kind of causality and necessity. But again, yeah, now quantum physics is, is messing things up, so. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a very broad question, but uh, someone like Ibn Sina says that existence is, is, is obvious, is an obvious uh, concept. We, you don't prove existence, so uh, uh, it, it's, and, and also I think the Greeks, uh, well, they, I think they were more concerned with existing things like Aristotle rather than perhaps being on existence in itself. Um, but then, obviously, in the medieval period, there's the difference between God. Well, there's, uh, they think, obviously, it's possible that um, it would have been possible for God not to create the world. And then we start thinking about being and non-being. And um, but for someone like even Sina, it's uh, it, it's absolutely obvious existence. We don't need to. It's like a first principle, and we know Aristotle talks about first principles and that they cannot be proved. And, and, and so it's, it's a first principle. We don't even uh, 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 prove that because it's so obvious. Yeah, but again, I mean, if you want to deny uh, reality, you can um, um, follow someone like Descartes, and he says, well, I can deny the existence of everything, but if I doubt I exist, and if I think I exist, and then something, or, or, we, we'll, we'll reach existence. Even if we start with the subject and the thinking subject, we have to reach existence at some point. Because obviously, what is it that thinks and doubts? Well, I do, so I exist. It, yes, yes, they say, or oh, Al-Farabi and even see they say, um, uh, this is one of the arguments. They say, if we have uh, two gods, uh, 
they, they have some connection with each other. And uh, they, they'll share a certain quality. And, and, and that quality is, is responsible um, for these two beings. So the quality itself rises above uh, these two gods. So you always need a first principle because they'll be sharing something. So it's, if you read it, it's, it's not possible to have two principles. You have to have one. Well, there you can see, this, this is the proof. If God has understanding, God also has life in the existence. All right, uh, so, this, uh, so this will come to my next question is, uh, how can we define that God has to be perfect? Like, what is the proof that everything that happened or everything that he created is 100% perfect? That's why we're going to be uh, reflecting his image as the perfect um, like existence. So those, those questions are related to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question why God is perfect, because we, I think, um, someone like Anselm would say, because we have the idea of a perfect being, uh, which is possible. Although we know that in, in, in certain religions, like Manichaeism, and this is a religion that disappeared, um, there's the idea of a, a God who's good, but is not all-powerful. So there are some religions which uh, def or defend or defended this. Um, but I think Anselm would say we have this idea of, of a perfect being. And, uh, and also, if we think about the, uh, Aristotle's proof, uh, also the idea of uh, an infinite, the idea that God has to be infinite. And then we talk about infinite, we say also having infinite qualities like um, that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, etc. So because otherwise, uh, again, we, that wouldn't explain the world we have or it wouldn't explain how things uh, Works. So I think we need the idea. Uh, um, we can, yeah, we think of God as perfect, and that also helps to explain um, f uh, natural phenomena. And uh, when it comes to robots, well, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, if if they really, we can make them equivalent to human beings. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and so I, I think you were asked before whether we're making what kind of assumptions this, these philosophers yes. are making when they make their rules. So, I mean, I just wanted to ask you whether, so even Sinek, for example, thinks that there is something which he calls a necessary existence. And that means, like, something, of, there are lots of things in the world that could be as they are or they could not be. Mm. They could Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things like that that are contingent, that could be or might not be, and they might exist or they might not exist. But then, um, if Insina says there's something, there's got to be something in the world that uh, is not like that. So something yes. that um, is the way it is, and that there's no way it could not be the way that it is. There's something that there's no way it could not have existed. So, I mean, my question is kind of, is that an assumption that there has to be something like that in the world? And that, that's just a question about Ibn Sin, I think yes. we also ask about, you know, Aristotle. Yeah. So Aristotle has this kind of idea that there has to be in the world something kind of like a wheel that's always turning, yes. or an engine that's always going, so that is, there are things in the world that are constantly moving, but there has to be, but they're, they stop moving and they start moving, or they start being active and then they stop being active, but there has to be, he says, something that's always on the move, always working, always active, and I guess
guess my question is, do you think that's an assumption? Or, well, that's yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I, um, I think there's several Aristotelian principles here which, um, um, so, uh, so according to Aristotle, if we talk about activity and, and movement, uh, he says, the, uh, so there's nothing in the cause which is not in the effect, and also nothing starts moving or becoming active unless they are rendered active by some, something which is already active. Uh, and so, uh, ultimately, in, but, but then even seen as very different from Aristotle. Um, and so I think for Aristotle, this is why he says that the prime mover itself is not moving, is not itself moving. I mean, it moves other things, so transitive, um, uh, transitive movement, but it, it doesn't, that this prime mover itself is the unmoved mover. Uh, and, and, and he says, yeah, we need to reach this. Um, this ultimate cause again. This principle that we cannot have an infinite chain of of causes. Which um, and when it comes when it comes to Ibn Sina, well, I, I defend although there are different uh, views um, that he's a determinist. So when he thinks about possibility, um, he, when he thinks about possibility, it's uh, possibility is the realm of the that which doesn't exist. So whatever exists is necessary and is made necessary by its cause. And what doesn't exist also, its non-existence is also necessary. And everything ultimately goes back to, uh, to God or God's um, causation explains everything. So I think he's a determinist. It's also interesting, I was reading once, and apparently the term contingent, I think is the end of hominon in, in Greek, was, was not translated as contingent, it was translated as possible. So there wasn't a term in medieval Arabic for contingent. There was only possible and necessary, and this is what they had. So in Ibn Rush, although we don't have the term, he does use possible in the sense of contingent, but I don't think this happens in Ibn Sina. There's no contingent. It's either possible or necessary. And then we have, I think, complete determinism. Whatever happens and whatever exists is through a necessary cause. And, and the ultimate necessary cause is God who's necessary in himself and has no possibility. So, I mean, in himself, is purely actual. So, I don't know if this helps, but yeah. So, but he's very different. Where obviously, in Arsenal, we don't know really if, I mean, there's a debate about whether he was a determinist or not. But I think even Cena is very clear that he was. <coughs> Yes. <laughs> no, because otherwise we have the infinite series of causes, yeah. which we cannot have. So we acknowledge that that's an assumption that he's making? Yes. Or would we say that scientists today are assuming that there could be a world in which there is no, nothing like that? In other words, scientists assume that we could have a world in which everything is a Mm-hmm. So, I mean... Maybe. Uh, well, I think you've seen a sort of, it, it, his system is very, it's self-contained and it's, well, logical, but yeah, maybe there are other possibilities. And, and there was this idea, uh, again, going back to Ghazali, apart from um, calling philosophers heretics, he, uh, he also came up with this idea of that this is the best of all possible worlds already, so we have this in Islamic uh, theology, so that there are other possible worlds, but this is the best one, and this is why this, this is the one that God created. So, yeah, there's this idea in medieval uh, Islamic theology. I really think that both are making assumptions. Sorry, the word? <coughs> Uh, sorry, to make what, sorry? A marriage or combination oh. between philosophy and science, especially nowadays, uh, as there are, as there is a lot of science who uh, talks uh, in uh, the, the matters as they can do, 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, well, an obvious connection between science and philosophy is philosophy of science, but then it's sort of philosophy judging science or philosophy talking about science, and, and, and then flo there's philosophy of the different sciences. Uh, so that, th there's, a, there's a connection, but, but I think philosophy can align itself more with, with humanities or it can align itself more with the sciences, and it, it's all philosophy. I, I think it's important to learn as much as possible if we have the time. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So actually we talked about this topic last time when we were talking um, what is philosophy and basically what we said is that we cannot really make these sort of separations, mm. philosophy, science, religion, they interconnect somehow but at the same time um, philosophy used to be historically merged with science mm. and religion. It used to be nat something called natural philosophy used to be uh, science today. And then there was a shift historically that happened, I think, towards the modern mm -hmm. ages. We talking, we're talking about after medievals, in which science, philosophy, and religion each became separated. And then we have disciplines like philosophy of science that basically tackle um, science and science scientific theory, but. We do have philosophers who really think about measure in science, and we do have philosophers who really think that science and philosophy should really be divorced, and they're judging science. And you, if you think of Heidegger, Heidegger is one philosopher who really hates science. But mm, a lot of philosophers really think that science and philosophy are not that far apart, and a lot of philosophers today are trying and historically tried to use what is called now science to develop some sort of a philosophy or to yeah. prove some sort of philosophy. So they, they interconnect sometimes, but they're not really the same thing because they have different methods. And philosophy has a lot of methods. Science has one method that comes out of philosophy as well. But they have different goals sometimes. They have connecting goals sometimes, but they cannot really get married nor divorced. Yeah, and also, if we go back, what does philosophy mean? And obviously, the uh, the term um, is um, uh, it's um, Pythagoras was a, a, a mathematician also who was credited with coming up with this term. He said the first one to say that he was a philosopher. And he was asked, "Well, what does that mean to be a philosopher?" And he says, "Well, I'm not a specialist in anything. I I, I talk about everything, and that's what a philosopher does. It what philosophy means. So I I don't think we can say well." This is not philosophy, and that's not philosophy, and we have to ignore the sciences. I don't think we can do that. So, uh. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think in this case, obviously, we're talking again about the robots. How do we, so if they're capable. Yeah, but yes, but if we think about the, the cause of the universe as being something, uh, a being which is uh, transcendent, then we, we talk about the games. Obviously, the games, it's, I mean, within the game itself, there's no notion of, but but we think about who created the game, and then and then that's another level. So uh, there's this transcendent reality. Yeah. 
in relation to the games that are created or Yes. He's just saying that if we're human beings, we cannot have the idea of God and...